So, I think we could get it started. We're three minutes past. Um, all right, just want to make sure you could, you could hear me okay. Could you, is that the case, uh, Ben, Dave, could you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, I, I can hear you fine. And uh, maybe before we start, we could just do um, a quick logistics item just to um, inform everybody. It's the first time we're using the stage, so we're going to try to record this. Um, so we're just informing everybody for privacy reasons. Right. Uh, thank you, Ben. Yeah. So we'll we'll try to make a recording, uh, and then we could upload it on uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, so people who weren't able to attend could find out some info. If you yeah would not feel comfortable with your uh, username being uh, like a seen as a participant here, then um, then yeah, just please be aware that perhaps you'd you'd not want to participate now, but you could listen to the recording later. Um, that's your decision, and, and we could all we could decide as a community if there's a better way in subsequent calls to record it without, uh, yeah, showing um, listeners stuff like that. So, um, and and in general, yeah, this is our first call and the first time we're using the the stage feature. So let's let's see how it goes. Um, all right. So again, thank you all so much for joining. A, a really big turnout and some familiar community faces. So really, really exciting. Um, as a brief agenda, um, and again, I think the community as a whole could help shape what we do on these calls in the future. If we don't like the format, if there's a, a different <coughs> arrangement, that would be uh, more helpful. Um, but we'll basically just give a, a quick Intro. I'll, I'll I'll briefly speak about the, the the teammates who who are on the call. Then we'll just hand it over to each domain, as we call it, each kind of subdomain within the the protocol and the project, uh, from zk to to client, uh, etc. Where one of the, the the teammates focusing on that, uh, one of the contributors focusing on that, can give an update on what they work on, how it fits together with the other pieces. Um, what are the key updates or the, the key things they're working on right now, uh, stuff like that. Um, then we will, uh, I'll pass it over to Dave to talk about the testnet, uh, which many of you are, are using and running nodes and proposals on, which has been uh, wonderful to see. So uh, we'll give a, a quick testnet overview by Dave. Um, then we'll likely just jump right into uh, a q and a section we've again we've collected a bunch of your great questions we'll we'll try to answer as many as we could get to um whatever we don't answer we could we could try to answer in that same uh community call <coughs> questions channel um so that's it it'll be pretty casual and and again any feedback on on the format here will be welcome after the fact so um yeah and and i guess one thing I should say is we'll try to do these monthly. Uh, maybe that'll be too frequently, maybe it'll be uh, too in infrequent, but um, we'll, we'll try to do these monthly um, and uh, we, we could take it from there. So on that note, um, I will briefly just uh, mention the, the folks you see on the stage, the, Right now, I see seven speakers. I won't go give a, a big intro on everyone. I'll let them, uh, they, could, they could speak about themselves in the context of the domain updates. But um, yeah, let, let, let's get into that. So um, I'm, I'm Matthew. I work on the kind of operations side here. Uh, so non-engineer, um, trying to uh, contribute on, on all the other facets. So. Uh, yeah, whatever operations entails, the community side, some of the the, the integrations and um, business side of things, that's, that's what I focus on. Um, we have Terrence, who does uh, similar stuff, uh, my teammate on the operations side. Um, again, I'll, I'll pass it to him uh, in the domain updates if he wants to say anything. Um, we also have Ben on the operation side. Many of you know him from the chat. Uh, really does a, a great job with the community and, and all those sorts of operations. Um, then we have Dave. Dave, you probably also recognize from the, 
the chat, the, the Discord channels. He helps on the operations side, uh, but kind of sits in the middle of operations and engineering as a developer experience focused contributor. Um, so that's a, a good segue into the engineering uh, teammates we have on the call. Uh, Daniel, um, many of you know uh, from past projects and uh, yeah, just from, from around uh, a very, um, uh, been contributing to Ethereum and scalability efforts for uh, a long time. Um, Daniel is an engineering leader. Um, and then we pop over to the ZK team. We have Brecht as a core ZK contributor, um, working on the, on the ZK VM components, and his teammate, our teammate, Alexi, also on the ZK side. So that's that's everyone we have on stage just to show who who's up here there's other teammates in the audience i could tell but um they they might not uh they might not jump on the stage this time so <coughs> that's that um just to get a lay of the land and why don't we pop right into the domain overviews so again just the all the little sub components that make the Tyco project as a whole um, I'd like to pass it to the ZK side to start, uh, which will be Brecht. So Brecht, please take it away. Maybe you could mention what uh, the ZK team works on. All right. Uh, hey, guys. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, well, just like a short overview, I guess. So uh, for the ZK side, uh, we contribute to like the community edition, uh, like yeah, the community edition of the ZK EVM. So it's kind of like a shared project where multiple uh, teams actually work on the same code base for on the circuit side. So it's uh, led by the Ethereum Foundation, and other projects um, also contribute to it. Um, so it's kind of like the circuit side, but also like on the on like the the proving library side so uh, we use like halo 2 for our plunk system uh plunk proving system and so we also have like a fork of that and like lots of optimizations and things like that um so that's kind of like where we like our sub team of the zk team uh kind of like works on uh, and so like yeah currently we are focusing on like a couple of things so maybe like the one most important one for the listeners, listeners is, is like, uh, yeah, our current testnet doesn't have like ZK enabled. So that's kind of like one of the things we want to focus on is getting like ZK proof generations for our blocks in the next testnet. So that's one thing we are looking into, uh, into enabling. Um, so it won't, like, yeah, to be clear, it won't be like 100%. So it will be like gradually. So we'll get like sub components as they are ready, like they will be merged in. Uh, and so we can actually uh, start using them. Uh, and then there's like yeah obviously like some some other things that we are uh implementing as well so like uh, we are working on like the Merkle Trisha tree uh circuits so lots of like um yeah some some optimizations work some some like yeah making sure everything works correctly but also some like refactoring going on there um also like yeah looking into the hash functions so like yeah we've contributed like uh, the kcheck hash function and shot 26 hash function and are looking into contributing the blake 2f uh, hash function as well so the blake 2f function is actually a hash function that's only exposed by a precompile but obviously we also need to support all the precompiles as a type 1 uh, zk evm so we also have to support that um, and for the rest uh, i guess like generally like yeah it's just like uh, implementing upcodes and stuff like that, uh, but also like yeah, looking into some of the optimizations on like the prover system side. And um, so currently we use like normal Plunk or Ultra Plunk or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but yeah, there's like some newer stuff that's coming out for like faster lookups and also like on the prover side like Hyper Plunk, Plunky Two stuff like that. And um, so we are looking into that to like optimize the the proving times. Um, yeah, I guess I can. I guess can I can leave it here for uh, for this small update. Thank you, Brecht. Um, that's that's great. Uh, Alexi, would you want to add anything uh, to the zk side, um, if you wish? Uh, hello, uh, Razano. I 
I think that uh, Brecht has uh, has told uh, everything everything that is important. So I think that uh, in in general there is nothing to be added. Okay, thank thanks, Alexi, um, and thank you, Brecht. Uh, yeah, this is uh, you know in some sense a, a huge core of the zk evm of course is uh the zk evm itself and, and as brecht said um we work uh, um based off of a a joint effort for many in the ethereum community led by the ethereum foundation's privacy and scaling exploration unit and uh, and many more teams contributing and yeah these are generally the uh the big brains as as uh, many people like to call them uh the the cryptography researchers and implementers and uh stuff that i can only uh you know hope to grasp uh the the broad takeaways um that's the really uh interesting stuff so thank you guys um next we would like to talk about the the client team so uh many of you are running an l2 client uh which is amazing to see i think we would like daniel to talk about uh yeah the Tyco client and anything in that realm Thank you, Matthew. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, yeah, so um, my my engineers are working on the client. Um, <coughs> because we try to be a type 1 ZK EVM, uh, we don't want to make a lot of changes to the, like the Go Ethereum um, code base. Um, if you look at the code, uh, the changes are really small. Uh, I think we want to stay that way because, you know, uh, the last modification we have uh, for the Go Ethereum client or the layer one implementation, the more compatible or equivalent uh, our uh, layer two will be uh, with respect to layer one. So going forward, I think uh, one, um, the, the following modification will, uh, first we want to enable um, 4844, the uh, program dump sharding, uh, to make sure, you know, the call data, um, the data is more, it is less uh, expensive. Um, so that's something pending. We haven't uh, done anything on that yet. Uh, the other thing is, actually, when we talk about this client, there are not just one software, there are multiple softwares. They work together to form this client. Uh, so one um, executable is the prover, right? As Brad mentioned, um, somewhere next quarter, we are going to um, uh, integrate zero knowledge proof verification into the core protocol. And then the client software will also have to support it. It will have to uh, you know, generate the proof, submit the proof, right? Um, and then the protocol on chain will verify those zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so that's something the client team will be working on. Um, I think they have, they have already started working on uh, that. Uh, 4844 for the dunk sharding will be uh, maybe somewhere in Q2, uh, even in, in Q3, depends on the progress uh, uh, on layer one. Uh, so as I said, the, the client modification uh, try to stay as minimum as possible. Uh, so <clears throat> um, if you look at the, the modification, the, the, the code change, um, don't be surprised that, uh, you know, the changes are so small, right? Uh, that's what we try to do, not to uh, uh, change the core protocol, uh, the, the client specification <clears throat> at all, to stay uh, as compatible, as equivalent as possible. Uh, Matthew, do you want me to also talk about the protocol, like uh, the other aspects? That would be great. Uh, thanks for that, Daniel. Yeah, going right into the protocol makes sense. Thanks. Um, we we had a first design in the, like February, very early stage of this project, uh, which is based on POS. But uh, this current version is not POS based. Uh, it really simplified uh, with two priorities. First is uh, we want to be type one. So the compatibility or equivalency is the uh, first priority. The other one is decentralization. We want to make sure the protocol is designed to be decentralized from day one, right? We don't have to go through a, a 
centralized um, phase and and then two years later we want we say hey we want to upgrade our protocol to become decentralized we want to make sure the first major version is decentralized um, uh, from you know bottom up <laughs> this current test net that uh, people are trying are still centralized because we have white listing uh, that's that's because we don't have tokenomics built in right because uh, we have to control some user behavior. Otherwise, this testnet will be spammed. Um, with next release, uh, with next public testnet, uh, it's going to be fully decentralized um, so that you guys can try to game the system, game the, uh, the, the chain to um, extract the, the maximum value for yourself to test whether our tokenomics uh, can prevent that from happening. Uh, so that's uh, we, we can talk about the the next uh, uh, test net later on. So the protocol now is mostly implemented. The only thing missing, I think, is the uh, zero knowledge proof verifier logics, which will be um, available sometime in Q1. And the other thing is, of course, the forty eight forty four the protocol dump sharding. Uh, to minimize the <clears throat> function data footprint uh, as call data. So we want to use uh, blob data instead of call data. Um, I think 4844 will be fully integrated before our, test, uh, our, our midnight launch, um, which is lucky for us because uh, otherwise we have to do like a, a production uh, upgrade of the protocol, right? So um, since 4844 happens earlier, than we thought, so we can you know afford waiting a little bit, and then when we launch our main night, it's forty eight forty four ready. Uh, so in general, I think the protocol is is now pretty well implemented, but not well tested yet. Um, it has only been tested in product in, in our test net, not as even as like unit tests. We don't have a lot of unit tests because we just want to make sure it, it works before we really push the limit of testing. Uh, every line of the code. Um, and then next is the tokenomics. Because you know, being fully decentralized means you have to have a set of rules to make sure different actors in the ecosystem can behave as expected, right? Nobody can harm others, nobody can gain the, the system. That's very challenging uh, as a, uh, like maybe the first decentralized layer two. Uh, it will take more time to uh, to simulate to test the tokenomics, so we are we are going to start that as soon as possible in the next quarter, um, and hopefully the tokenomics makes sense. Uh, otherwise, we have to change it uh, uh, along the way. But in general, I think the protocol, the core protocol itself, um, the cross chain communication, uh, the the messaging system, um, my my personal like I have really strong confidence in the current design. Uh, even though the implementation may have some problems, it's not a big problem at all. We can, you know, sooner or later find those problems <coughs> and fix them. But the overall design, I think, is very solid. Um, there's no, like, layer two consensus algorithm running along with, like, uh, validity proof verification or something like that. Anyone can propose a block if they want, if they are willing to pay the fees. Uh, so that makes Pico hopefully the, the, the first truly decentralized layer two. But I cannot claim it before we launch our mainnet, right? Hopefully we can uh, be the number one. Uh, but uh, it's okay if we are not, uh, because we, we really want to see different layer tools to be all, uh, you know, succeed in, in Ethereum, and we can, you know, help each other to achieve, we can learn from, from each other. Um, so in general, I think uh, what I'm saying is protocol design implementation um, is uh, meets our expectation. It's pretty well done, uh, but we just need to launch another test net to fully test those uh, core components. Matthew, back to you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, that's super helpful, I'm sure, for, for many here, uh, myself included. And I just want to, uh, because Daniel spoke about <clears throat> two topics, just to kind of help conceptualize the different pieces uh, midway when he 
uh, when he you know re referred to me for a second. That was when he switched from client to protocol. So those are kind of two separate uh, domains, if you will. Um, just want to call that out so people could conceptualize the different pieces, um, the, the client and then the protocol. Um, thank you, Daniel. Uh, next, we would um, talk about like the, the bridge domain. That's been a kind of a specific focus of, uh, of certain teammates and contributors, um, none of which are actually on the stage right now, uh, the folks that have worked on that. Um, I could say at a, at a high level, the bridge is what many of you have already used, uh, right, for message passing between the layer one and the layer two in the test net. Um, uh, uh, yesterday, around this time, it was to the tune of, uh, I think, 15,000 messages passed uh, between the layers. I'm not sure what it is today, uh, but but thank you all for, for using the bridge. Um, the bridge is super important, uh, of course. Some people would uh, kind of think of roll-ups as, um, or all scaling solutions as like, how secure is the bridge? Is it a trustless bridge? Can you even get to that uh, keyword of trustless or yeah, uh, you know, a validating bridge, right? Relying on on the on the the, the validity proofs and uh, um, yeah, ha have a validating bridge to <coughs> pass messages, not some uh, multi-sig or or whatnot control uh, the, the state of the world uh, between between both environments through the bridge. So that's that's how to uh, conceptualize. The bridge. I don't know if anybody, uh, maybe, maybe Daniel, Dave, or Brecht, if you do want to mention the bridge or or what is next, or of course anybody. Uh, there's other teammates here in the audience. If 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 you guys wanted to jump in from the bridge side, but uh, Daniel, maybe you have something to add. Yes, a little bit. Um, so the bridge, because I designed the bridge. Um, so I know the the underlying there's a like a, a signal service uh, in the bridge system. So that service is actually the very a uh, fundamental piece of the uh, the rollup protocol. Basically, you can use, use the signal se the service to uh, to to pass any arbitrary like data between those two layers, layer uh, layer one and and Tyco. We don't really interpret those signals. It's up to the application. So the Tyco's official bridge using that signal service. That which also means you know some other. People, if they want to deploy their own bridge contracts on top of Tyco and Ethereum, they can also use our uh, signal service to build their own bridge. Um, in other words, our bridge, our official bridge, is not the only one that you, you can trust. Anyone who are going to build a bridge open source built on top of Tyco's the signal service is trustless. If it can be trusted, you can, you can use third party bridges. And it's now our, in our best interest to build a like a, a complete bridging system or application uh, to compete with ecosystem partners, right? If you are building your own bridge, you have your project, you can just migrate your bridge to Tyco uh, by changing a few lines of code to adopt our um, signal service, and then your bridge will be working perfectly on Tyco and Ethereum. <coughs> um, so we, we really welcome other people to build third party bridges. Uh, the current one is, should be simple and strong and uh, secure, uh, but it's not going to cover all the use cases. It's not our goal. Our goal is to offer the infrastructure layer so application developers can build whatever bridges or DX they want to um, without competing with us. Uh, we, we try to be minimum. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Uh, as many of you know, there's um, projects that are bridge projects, and they, they deploy to the environments that they want to um, and provide a service. They could provide liquidity, uh, fronting liquidity for people uh, before, uh, in the case of an optimistic rollup, before that, that challenge period is, uh, has elapsed, um, even potentially in ZK rollups with longer proof generation times. Uh, bridges that front liquidity or liquidity providing bridges uh, before a, a proof, a validity proof is generated, um, which is needed for the other chain to read the state. So yeah, that's that's a, a wide open uh, field to work with uh, ecosystem 
projects. Um, all right. Uh, last but not least, the uh, the kind of subdomain would be operations. Um, we've alluded to it a little bit. I'll say a, a quick word on it, and um, would also uh, pass it to Dave and Terence and Ben if they'd like. Um, but yeah, operations is a, is a lot of the stuff that that uh, you all see day to day um, in the chat or that you interact with um, even on on the website. So it's really a big umbrella term as as one could imagine but um yeah it's everything from you know the <clears throat> community organization and i guess i'd like to shout out here um you know we have a few moderators in the audience i see well well the only two official moderators that we have in the discord um that's blank and x um so so thank you guys for doing a great job in what i would call uh you know operations and community organization uh, really appreciate your help um, maybe we'll touch on that a bit later we'd like to grow that team that uh, the, the community team the moderation team so uh, thank you guys um, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well um, it's also uh, more on the develop the developer experience <coughs> side as well um, as we said uh, Dave uh, you know the, the docs you interact with I mean that's a team effort, but a lot of that is uh, is is Dave on the operations team um, trying to give developers and, and users the best experience. Um, that'll also be the team that you see uh, at, at events uh, in the coming year, hopefully, uh, right? Live events, virtual events, hackathons, um, just um, everything in that realm. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll 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 pause it there. I, I've spoken enough on it. Ben, Terence, Dave, if uh, if any of you want to speak on stuff you're working on or general ops stuff, feel free. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matthew. <clears throat> yeah, just to um, update the community on a few things, you know, we're thrilled to announce that we've <clears throat> reached a major milestone um, today on Discord. We've exceeded uh, 10,000 users. So that's a testament to the hard work that the team have uh, put forward and the dedication and also the support of our community. So thank you very much for that. Um, from a Twitter perspective, we have over 12,000 um, supporters there also. So we have um, an ever expanding community and we haven't even started yet. So thank you guys for um, all of the support. <clears throat> So I uh, don't know if um, Dave or Terence, you guys want to mention anything? Uh, yeah, I can briefly talk about the developer experience um, domain as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, as you know, Tyco is like very community focused. So I think one of the, the things we like to focus on with the developer experience is kind of enabling anyone in the community to, you know, build things on Tyco to learn about Tyco. So we really want it to be like um, this like enabling process and, and frictionless for you to understand how Tyco works, understand how to build on it and, uh, and, and make it easy for you to use. So uh, any feedback on, on this experience and, 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 and making it easy for you is, uh, is very valued. So um, definitely make sure to leave some feedback if you'd like. I just want to add one thing. <clears throat> so Tyco still has a small team. Most of us are engineers. Um, just want to give you a sense of like what, what Tyco team would look like, right? So uh, we are still trying to expand, to expand the uh, engineering team. We are trying to hire more uh, people. Uh, uh, since we have like so many people here, I just want to uh, deliver this message to you. If you want to contribute to the Typo repositories, we have open source everything. Um, it will be easier for us to, to hire someone who has contributed some code to our repository and then have the interview. Uh, otherwise, you know, there are so many people applying for, <coughs> uh, for jobs. Um, so I just call out for the community if you are interested in building things together with us, you know, uh, contributing to our open source repositories is a good way to <clears throat> to start, and um, hopefully you can be part of the Tyco experience. 
Hi everyone. Uh, this is Terence. I'm also very happy to say hi to to all of you. Uh, I'm the first free person to started that that started the the Taiko journey with the co-founder team uh, at the beginning of the year. And uh, you know, I'm uh, you like uh, Matthew's introduction. I'm usually be working behind the scene uh, on strategy, investor relationship, um, uh, biz staff, uh, etc. And um, you know, we we are very happy that at the very early beginning, from the very beginning of this project, we already have some uh, pretty visionary, passionate uh, investors, uh, institution to to support us. Uh, and in a very quick, a very short time, I'm I'm thrilled to see that um, there are 2,400 people actually joined the stage today with us. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, hi everyone! Thanks a lot for the support. Very excited. We'll, we'll make sure that you know this journey will bring something very exciting for for the whole Ethereum ecosystem. All right, great. Um, thank you three for that. Um, awesome. Okay. Uh, by the way, everyone, first of all, thank you for bearing with us. We're, we're 35 minutes in. We'll try to keep this to an hour to respect everyone's time. Uh, again, we'll, we could uh, always update the format we do this. We could do them more frequently or, or, or differently. So um, I think the last thing before we get into the uh, Q&A is just to actually go through the uh, a testnet overview, which Dave will will do. Some of you have are already, are already power users of it, but just to talk about the testnet very briefly um, and maybe, uh, yeah, some call to actions or some early things we're, we're seeing or would like to see. Uh, so Dave, please take it away. Yeah, definitely. Um, so for the Tyco testnet, most of the information you can find about interacting with it is on our main website at tyco.xyz. Um, and, you know, I think one of the goals is we really want the community to be able to, like, understand Tyco and to be able to build on it and, and, and play with it. Just try to get some usage out of it and, and even break it in some ways so that we can collect uh, data on it and, and improve it. So... Yeah, so you know, in, in the test net, there's basically a guide, which I mentioned is on the main website. We have um, a faucet for you to receive tokens on either of um, the layers, and uh, we also have a bridge to uh, bridge from our private L1 to Tyco and back. Um, we have some guides on how to do contract deployment with Foundry, uh, and we also have a uh, simple Tyco node repository, which should give you a frictionless experience for you to uh, run a node uh, uh, just as a general node or also as a proposer. Um, so the only requirement for that would be you need to have Docker on your machine, so it should be fairly simple. And also we have the block explorers where you can check out the activity on our privately deployed L1 and also on Tyco. And finally, you can submit feedback. So we have uh, two areas for feedback, like one is in our GitHub discussions, and the other one is a feedback channel within Discord. So we really want to like uh, have like valuable feedback here. So uh, anything that you can provide, which you know can help improve Tyco, is is definitely really encouraged. And I'll also mention that um, the activities that you do on Tyco. Um, by the end of January, we'll be eligible for a Pope, which we will be distributing. And the way that to do that is you just need to essentially interact with the testnet um, in two of out of three ways. So like the first would be a bridge transaction, and then and then the other ones would be some type of like transfer or DAP transaction. So a transfer between accounts or uh, deploying a contract. Uh, so any two of those three. And... Yeah, basically what we'll do is you don't need to submit anything to be eligible for that Pope. Like we'll just scan the chain and be able to determine the addresses to distribute the Pope to. So that's just kind of to recognize, you know, your contribution and, and help and during our testnet. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can do here for the testnet. I would say 
definitely stay curious about how it works, ask questions, um, even answer questions. And a lot of people have been helping the community. So I'd say that's, that's really great to continue that. Um, as Daniel said, for contributions, it's really encouraged. And if you're curious on how to contribute, there's a contributing uh, guide on our Tyco Mono repository. Um, you can check that out. It's uh, called contributing.md. And yeah, that's that's essentially it with the test net. So um, yeah, I'll give it away to the Matt, I guess. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, and again, thanks everyone for using the test net. Um, it's it's awesome. And back to Daniel's other point and Dave's point on the contributing. Please feel free. Everything is open source. Uh, yeah, contribute uh, code uh, is like definitely a great way to uh, be seen as maybe someone we'd like to contribute full time. Um, there are open positions on Tyco. Dot XYZ, uh, a little careers page. Um, we'll we'll look. We'll be looking to expand the team. We need uh, lots more contributors. So please feel free to to jump right in. Um, and there, there's there's definitely ways beyond uh, code contributions as well. So okay, with 20 minutes left, let's jump right into the questions. Um, ben has. Uh, a list of, of questions he's amassed from the, the Discord channel um, and the, the, the Reddit thread for that purpose. So he's kind of combined some, taken the, the most popular ones. Anything we don't answer, I, I apologize in advance. Um, if, if it's a burning question, we'll definitely, let's, we'll answer it in the chat or, uh, yeah. So Ben, I, I hand it over to you, please. Okay, thank you, Matthew. So in terms of, um, you know, Dave talking about the testnet, I think let's uh, quickly start there. So one of the questions we've had from uh, one of our community members, BH Lee, from our Discord, is what is the purpose of the Alpha One testnet? And is it preparing rewards for testnet participants? So I think uh, most of that's already been answered by Dave. So the purpose of the testnet is to um, make sure that, you know, we are ready for you guys to test it and to try and break it so that we can get all of the statistics and information um, possible so that we can improve on the service that we're going to be providing going forward. Ben, the, the, may I yeah. answer the question from another perspective? Yes. <clears throat> you, know, uh, you mentioned, um, so what I'm trying to add to your answer is that uh, from a protocol perspective, we want to make sure the core protocol um, is tested uh, in production. Now, not the not the production, but I mean the um, the public test net, right? So uh, the core protocol doesn't include the tokenomics or the zkp because, as uh, the other day, Brack told me, uh, you know, the zkp is either work working or, or not working, right? So it's just uh, a validity proof. But the protocol has a lot of rules that we need to test. We need to make sure you know the design of the protocol, which involves proposers uh, and approvers. Those two roles, uh, those two roles, they can work together uh, somehow. Uh, so one goal uh, of mine is to test this core protocol in this first uh, public test net to make sure, you know, overall uh, the block, uh, you know, building, proposing, uh, and, you know, proving. Uh, verify verification it all all works so that's one of my goal and, and so far everything seems uh, to be very promising uh, so yeah that's that's my like uh, two cents to to the question thank you daniel thank you. um so the next question about the testnet is is node installation available for everyone so on our tyco.xyz website, there is a uh, node deployment instruction manual. So yes, the node installation is available for anybody who wishes to run a node. So uh, that question was from Hey Rocket. And um, the other question from Hey Rocket was, will the test node be rewarded? Um, currently for the test for the test net, um, the, the nodes are not rewarded, 
um, but you will be able to gain a POW up, as Dave mentioned, for the other activities. Also, something there. Um, so, the, the philosophy that we have in reward community, community is that if we don't, we don't really want to set up uh, rules for rewarding people beforehand because we don't really know what will help us to you know, improve or test the, the, the test net. So we'd rather to do it later on. Let's say when we are ready to launch the next public test net, and then we look back to what people have done with the first test net and say, OK, these behaviors are really helpful. Um, we should re reward those behaviors. And if there are, there are a lot of spams there, you know, we can say, okay, those are spams, we should filter them out, right? So uh, I'm not saying that going forward, we will always do this. We will never set up rules beforehand. But uh, as a, a general rule, I think we should always do like, uh, you know, this kind of like analysis of existing behaviors to decide, you know, how to reward people. Um, later on, when it, you know, sometimes we need to set up rules beforehand. If those, if some behaviors really needs resources, for example, when we launch tokenomics, then you know some proposing, uh, you know, block proposals, they need to pay some tokens, right? All of those tokens are testnet tokens only, but they still need to get get those tokens and pay out those tokens. So they need to set up. They need to use a more powerful machine to run. Like provers, right? So we we should set up rules to reward those people because they need to, you know, uh, you know, uh, have a budget for those resources. So I think it's going to be a mix of those two uh, approaches. Um, we try to be like fair. If you really contributed to the Tyco uh, development process, if you know it really helped us, you know, succeed, we should contribute. Uh, back to to your effort. So we have, uh, you know, a budget of a, a lot of tokens uh, that we'll put into a DAO, uh, and the DAO will reward um, uh, pre and, and and after mainnet launch behaviors like that. Uh, so as Matthew mentioned, this the Tyco project tries to be a community project. Uh, it should be done. It should be built by every one of us, not just the, the core team. We set up some rules, we, we set up the foundation, and on top of it, if you are passionate about Tyco, if you have time, you have resources, you want to contribute, you can always find a way to contribute. I mean, there are a lot of work to, to be done, and we are um, like shorthanded right now. So um, read, our, read our web paper, read our code base, and then try to contribute, I guarantee, you will receive rewards. Thank you, back to Ben. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I think that need, leads us nicely into um, a question because uh, you mentioned the DAO. And uh, we have a question from Wolfez um, regarding, you know, what is the plan for the DAO and is there any information currently about this? And in terms of um, a high level roadmap as well, and I think, you know, um, from a, a testnet perspective, we've only just launched the Alpha 1 testnet. So um, that was in, you know, just now, just December time. Um, we plan also in um, sometime in Q1 with the various updates that we plan um, to launch a new uh, version, an upgraded and improved version of the public testnet, which includes um, ZK proofs um, and and, and um, also uh, make it more decentralized as well. Uh, and then um, as we go into you know, the second quarter, um, as we have more learnings, there will be um, further uh, testnets available. And um, you know, potentially, you know, we've got um, mainnet as well, um, either at the end of this year or early next year, uh, depending upon um, how things go. So throughout the year, we're going to be um, imp implementing um, more things such as, you know, tokenomics as well into the various um, test nets. So that's something for everybody to look out for. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add any more there. 
Uh, thanks, Ben. Agreed with all that. And um, I think it's a great question. I don't have too much to add, just that, um, yeah, the DAO or governance in general, um, you know, it's part of decentralization, roll up decentralization. Uh, we released a blog post um, last week or so that titled Roll Up Decentralization, which primarily talks about a decentralized implementation so the the protocol and you know the ability for uh participants to cheat w w without lots of resources to, to participate as node runners proposers provers um it's like a kind of more technical definition of decentralization but then on the governance side um that's half the uh half the battle or however you'd want to slice it um governance must be kind of broadly distributed have incentivized uh stakeholders who want to like make the best decisions for the protocol as a whole not for some small subset not for core contributors or a wider circle of contributors but yeah that has the keys to answer questions like upgradability uh when can we when can the protocol upgrade contracts um or even uh even there's there's some line of thought about like multi-proof systems that that Vitalik has spoken about recently, uh, where validity proofs is is one you know state transition check fraud proofs might be another, and in the case that they ever conflict, the DAO might be a tie-breaking vote uh, of what is the proper state of the roll-up. So just to say, it's like a huge topic. Um, it's not well defined yet uh, i think this will also be built in public with the with the community um and the goals will just be for like robust broad participation because uh, a roll-up can't be decentralized if it doesn't have uh, a meaningfully distributed dao making the key decisions so i uh, just want to add that it's it's not um yeah it's uh i, I guess i'll just leave it there um I just want to add that uh, Tyco doesn't have to build our own DAO. If there is a good solution there uh, of some third party, um, they want to collaborate with Tyco to build a DAO for Tyco, you know, it, it's an option for us, right? Because we are more experienced building a ZK rollup than building a DAO. So we don't have to become a DAO expert uh, to have something to govern uh, the Tyco protocol, right? So if there are other options, you know, the better just use better options, you know, instead of building everything, uh, uh, you know, by ourselves. So uh, if you are experienced with DAO um, and you feel like, hey, I can, you know, assemble a, a team to work with Tyco to build this DAO in parallel with the ZK rollup, talk to Matthew, talk to us. Uh, maybe we can, you know, have a, join the force uh, to build a DAO. Uh, so, you know, just, just want to deliver this message to, to the community. Thank you, Daniel. And I think um, in terms of the DAO question, um, it leads nicely into a question from Fermontiel um, about how do we plan to decentralize the whole um, ZK EVM solution? Um, Daniel, I know you touched on it briefly, and we've also talked about um, the DAO governance and the voting mechanism. Um, how do we exactly um, plan on decentralizing the solution, and how long will it take? Uh, so it's not really accurate to say we are going to decentralize the ZK EVM, because ZK EVM is just a, a you know, it would be a binary to create a proof. So it's basically just a validity proof. You cannot just decentralize the validity proof, right? So um, assuming there's a, a validity proof system there, uh, ready to go, um, the, the accurate question is, how do we decentralize the, the rollup itself, right? So usually, if you look at other existing uh, general purpose layer tools, they have this role called sequencers, which basically collect um, uh, transactions from the mempool build blocks, and then he's the only one, um, you know, has the power to propose a block, right? To, to, to uh, you know, to order, 
the uh, transactions in in a block. So with Tyco, we get rid of that uh, role entirely. So anyone can assemble, uh, you know, build a block and then propose a block and to compete with other proposers to you know to um, to get the next uh, uh, slot. So that's already built into our protocol. That's why we say you know Tyco is decentralized from day one because we don't even have this sequencer role uh, there. But of course you can call things differently. But uh, you know if you look at our protocol code, you will notice that there's no single uh, address that has been whitelisted to be the only one that can do something. Any any address can do things according to those rules. They can compete with each other. You know. Uh, by by building their own like proposing algorithm or improve the prover system to make sure it's less uh, uh, resource consuming. So so by decentralizing the layer the zk rollup or the layer two, we are really talking about how to decentralize the the uh, layer two protocol itself, right? Uh, so it, it's it's done with Tyco, but to be to be verified, to be tested in the next public test net. Thank you. Thank you for that. Right. One thing to add, maybe it's it's helpful, and, and that's, a, that's a great answer. Maybe fair Montiel meant, uh, although I won't, I won't speak for you, it's kind of like an industry problem, all the terminologies. Some people call the entire solution the ZK EVM, right? Like, you know, it's like, yeah, Tyco is a ZKVM and all, you know, there's several other projects building a ZK. So maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe as a community, we could uh, coalesce on language. Like, does the ZKEVM mean the, the right, the, the, the validity proof component, right? What Brecht and Alexi spoke about and what Daniel just spoke about, or is the whole solution a ZKEVM? It's like a, it's a lingo thing. So I don't know what Fair Montiel meant exactly, but um, it's it's kind of interesting to think in the future. That's yeah, that's a good point, Matthew. So from uh, from operational perspective, sometimes people, even we call the whole solution ZKEVM sometimes, right? Um, but from an engineering perspective, we are like uh, trying to say if this is validity proof, uh, you know, which is um, op code based, it has a, you know, one to one mapping to the to the op code in the in the EVM. But now we, you know, have a, a circuit to really verifying all the execution uh, of the EVM. You know, so we we engineers talk things differently, and sometimes I, I cannot just switch really, you know, um, without error between the, you know engineers and, and non engineers. Um, but in general, I think the answer stays the same. Uh, the, the decentralization of this layer two or zk rollup or zk EVM really depends on the protocol rules, right? How you how you authorize people to propose block, you know, how it's based on tokenomics or it's based on a whitelisting or, you know, uh, these things. So, so Tyco got that, the, this, um, I, I would say it solved the problem already, but to be verified. Um, we stay optimistic about our solution, but uh, only time can tell whether this solution is the best one because we are competing with each other and learning from each other as well. Uh, so hopefully, if you pay attention to Tyco's next testnet, you will figure out whether our solution, what's the pros and the cons, and uh, help us to improve, uh, please. Uh, yeah. Matthew, yeah, so Matthew. We've, oh, we've, okay. yeah, so we've just mentioned there that um, we, we've talked about valid validity proofs there. Um, another question from Fermontiel was, uh, what fraud proof is going to be implemented to avoid bad actors? So currently we implement um, validity proofs, but um, maybe um, later on there are plans uh, to implement um, a different type of um, fraud proof. Would that um, be something that we would be considering in the future? Uh, Brad, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, yeah. I guess uh, this is also leans uh, towards like the decentralization part because like yeah, there's like two different concepts, right? So like the core protocol is like decentralized by design. Uh, it's just like the safety wheels or like the if something would go wrong, uh, then we have like okay, there's like could be like a DAO or whatever that 
could jump in to like try to mitigate the, the problem. And so like yeah, like the Vitalik's like multi prover thing, like one of the things we could also use would be like a fraud proof. Uh, so like an optimistic style prod proof to also be necessary before like the block is completely like uh, finalized on chain. Um, and so because we are actually like a type one ZKVM uh, and we actually uh, strictly do like yeah, abide by the rules of Ethereum, this is actually could be like a, a simple thing we could add uh, the, compared to like other projects that try to like change things to make it more ZK friendly, we could actually like just take like one of the fraud proof systems of like optimism and just add them to our protocol uh, to have like an extra layer of security if something would go wrong uh, with our ZK proofs uh, in like the, the short to mid term. Um, so that's kind of like one thing that's kind of like a, a, a pretty like unique uh, also like a benefit of like staying like a strict type one um, ZKVM. Uh, the other thing is like we also have like already like a kind of like fraud proofy uh, kind of like mechanism mechanism i think like uh, currently enabled as in like if there's like a if, like for, for example if you submit a zk proof for a block and this block has like a certain block hash then the zk proof should only be possible like you should only be able to generate the zk proof with that block hash and so on our contracts you we already have like a system there that says like, okay, if somebody is able to generate a ZK proof for a certain block with a different block hash, then we are sure, sure that like there's something wrong with the ZK proof. And then we need to like yeah, disable uh, something or like yeah, try to like go into uh, some kind of like safety mode and things like that. So uh, like, yeah, there's like lots of different possibilities there. There's also like the possibility to have like a like another, uh, like a full ZK proof there. Um, so like, yeah, we're, we're, with our current ZK circuits, it's kind of like built with like a low level uh, language, uh, which makes it um, like a very performance, uh, like very good performance, but maybe like a little bit more, uh, uh, like yeah, just more more risks in like code implementation because that's like easier, like yeah, it's easier to miss stuff. Um, and so one of the other ZK proofs that we could add later would be like maybe, uh, um, like a, a proof for a, an Ethereum block that's written in like a different language or like a different um, uh, like a proofing system or something like that. So kind of like the multi-node um, approach, uh, but then that can apply to like ZK proofs. Um, but yeah, there's like, yeah, lots of possibilities there. Uh, and I think like, yeah, fraud boost is one, ZK proofs is another one. Using the DAO as like an extra mechanism is also another one. Uh, but yeah, lot, lots of things to, to explore. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> so, um, conscious of the time, um, so let's quickly move on to maybe some of the less technical questions. Um, we have a large number of um, Loopring um, holders, and uh, one question from Frank was asking around clarity for the Loopring holders not being forgotten. So, I believe um, this is part of the overall tokenomics around um, network and bootstrapping and um, distribution of tokens once um, those are all finalized. So we're keen to get this right for everybody. And uh, that's why currently, you know, tokenomics is still being built into the whole solution, which is why for the testnet, we, currently we still don't have this in place. But look, going forward, we will have um, something in place and we will be ensuring that you know we will have a decentralized and robust governance. Um, ben, I want to add one thing here because all those uh, four co-founders here, right? So Matthew, Terence, uh, Brecht, we uh, all used to work for Loopring. Um, so we we love the Loopring community. We, you know, the community will not be forgotten. The other day, I tweet that uh, you know. Uh, I, I thank the Loopring community and the Tiger community. And uh, some people say, hey, it's the it's only one community, right? The Loopring Tiger community. So we are not going to forget an, anyone. Uh, but, um, you know, it's just too early to outline any airdrop uh, details. Um, even if we have that, we cannot say anything about that. It's just too early, right? So be patient with us and help us with the uh, the technology uh, make sure Tyco can have a chance to 
uh, win the layer two competition, <clears throat> I think uh, there will be airdrops, uh, but uh, there's no details I can talk about now. So um, I guarantee I won't forget the Loopring community. I don't think any Tyco co-founders will forget that community, that wonderful community at all. So uh, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, thank you. Some fun facts then. Um, how many team members do we have? I believe the answer to that is currently we have uh, 20 team members and uh, we have also have uh, questions around the career path. And I think that leads nicely into um, the ambassador program that we'll be announcing um, very shortly. Um, Matthew, I don't know if you want to uh, quickly just give an overview of the ambassador program. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so this is something that will be very exciting. Uh, I've spoken to some community members about it already. Basically, a program to allow uh, quicker uh, co contributions, people that are, are really keen to, to help out, um, a program uh, which will mostly focus on roles of developer advocacy, developer relations, developer education, maybe that's all one bucket, and then s same thing for uh, non-developer side of things. So community uh, advocacy and organization. So maybe there's like two broad paths there for ambassadors, but um, yeah, I think you'll see a post about this very <clears throat> early in the new year. Um, there'll be a post explaining it and a little uh, submission form and we'll try to gather interest uh, for people that, that want to contribute. And this will be just a way to, to get involved um, kind of more loosely. And then we could like see the fit, see the, the, the focus area, and that could turn into like a full-time uh, contributor role. Uh, again, I think there's many paths to become a contributor. Uh, it's possible you become a, tr a contributor without ever speaking to anybody currently in this call, uh, either on stage or in the community. It's all open source uh, and, and open uh, for, for everybody to take part. But the ambassador program will be some type of streamlined way. Uh, and again, the, the different roles there, developer relations, community organization, moderation, content creation, um, really kind of just helping spread the word uh, to users and developers will be the the main thrust of it. So keep an eye out for that probably within the next week or so. And yeah. Great, Matthew. Thank you very much. And I think that leads us nicely into the very important question, um, which is, you know, the, what the role of the ambassadors will help us with. And that's also around um, spreading the message of, you know, how is Tycho different from other Ethereum L2s. I think that's also a, one of the most popular questions that we're asked. So in general, you know, Tyco is a general purpose EVM compatible, um, which basically means that any applications on Ethereum can just work on um, Tyco without any modification or at least very, very little modification. So our aim in terms of being the difference is that we are going to be a type one ZK EVM. Um, and the only other organization currently working on that is the Ethereum Foundation, the PSE. And um, <clears throat> yeah, we aim to be compatible and we aim to also have um, the security of Ethereum as well as the base layer. So um, from a high level perspective, um, we aim to take all the security from the Ethereum Foundation, uh, sorry, the Ethereum um, blockchain, along with the decentralization for the transactions and also the smart contracts. Does anybody want to add anything more? No. Um, in that case, um, that covers all of the questions that I've collated. Um, I'm just quickly scanning to see if there's anything else that we haven't covered um, from the uh, Discord chats. Um, 
Great. Yeah, I know there's probably I mean, some of those questions were like condensed into uh, into simplified versions. You you make me realize, Ben, that like we didn't give you know a definition. What is Tyco? I guess we take it for granted. Everybody here is uh, in the community has some base level interest, right? We didn't cover the steps of what is a type one ZK EVM or a type one Ethereum equivalent ZK rollup. So definitely some assumption of uh, of base level knowledge um and uh yeah but i guess I'll, I'll just say um again thank you so much for everybody joining i think this uh was like much greater participation than we could have hoped for in the future i guess they'll be different by definition because we won't have to go through that bit more of an intro process who is everybody what are the domains that happen maybe they could be much more community focused indeed like jump right into the questions. Maybe we could even find a way just to let everybody speak. Uh, I'm not sure the stage mechanics exactly, but uh, I would prefer this isn't just uh, a few speakers. We should allow community to, to come on and, and speak um, if we could do it in, in some semi-coordinated way. And uh, yeah, so I think like from here on out, they'll be a bit different um, and much more, yeah, you know, the basics have, been covered hopefully we won't have to to uh, keep going over that but um that's uh that's it for me again just a, a huge thank you to everybody that's that's been around it's so early in the project's life but um some of you have been such uh, strong supporters it's just uh it's, it makes the the world of difference and um uh thank you I don't know if anyone else has any closing remarks. Uh, not, not really, not really. I think uh, we just hit the one hour uh, time window. Actually, it's nine minutes. Uh, it, it's great to be here with all those um, nice audience here. We have sometimes over like uh, 2,400. Uh, it, it's great. So. Hopefully to see you very soon uh, next time. Uh, it's probably around the, the time we launch the next public test net. Um, so join the next one as well, please. And follow Great. us on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, thanks again. And, and again, next time, let's uh, please give your feedback on this call. Was this... Uh, did you like it? Should we indeed focus on peer questions next time? Let's let's assume next one we'll get more speakers on here, community members. It'll be ambassadors by then. It'll be a wider participation. So uh, let's aim for that next time. Thank and you everyone that, for attending. So I guess uh, with that, we we'll, we can close the call. Thank you everybody for your attendance you. and your support, guys. Thank you. Bye.